what's poppin'? This is the Skullcast featuring Adam Davis of Omnigon. Today on the program, we're talking to Adam Davis, frontman for Omnigon, you know what I'm saying? Adam elaborates plans for future Omnigon music and his experience with Bad Time Records as well as taking us through his time in the bands Link 80, Narboots, Dessa, Lucky Strike, Flat Planet, as well as his illustrating background and as well as his skills in fitness training. Thank you everybody for listening. This is the Skycast. Let's help welcome Adam Davis. Adam Davis. Adam Davis. What up, bro? Yo, what up? This is the Skycast. <laughs> what to do, man? How you doing? Good. How you doing? Good, man. I appreciate you making the time, man. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me on. If it's cool with you, you know, maybe we can kind of get like a crash course into who Adam Davis is, you know, maybe a deep dive into your story as a musician, you know, how you came up, like kind of what, what uh, drew you into the, into the genre. If, uh, if, uh, if, if that's, uh, if that's right with you, of course. Sure. Of course. Um, so I probably started playing guitar around probably a little bit before my 16th birthday. Mm. Um, solely started playing guitar because I wanted to be in a, in a band. I didn't really have, I didn't have highest aspirations to be like a really good guitar player. I just wanted to be in a band. So I started, you know, playing around with some friends and uh, had a little band that didn't really do anything in high school except for just play some like backyard parties. Right. And then um, eventually, you know, played some, some shows with Flat Planet and they were going to a lot of the local ska shows. So that was bands like um, Skank and Pickle and Janitors Against Apartheid and yeah. the rudiments uh we played at, we played in a barn with the hippos okay and so that was kind of my introduction to to ska and ska punk i i never came up listening to like the classics i i was just kind of immersed in that scene mm. and um so then when the guitar player from flat planet wanted to take off and, and uh move to oregon uh yeah. I, I jumped in and learned learned how to play ska as best i could um he was a really phenomenal guitar player so for me to replace him was a lofty lofty goal but you know i got a crash course in how to play upstrokes and how to play bar chords oh word. okay okay yeah so, so what what uh what uh what style did you start off playing when you when you picked up the guitar was it just kind of like the basics just like open chords here and there or uh or how? i mean when i when i first started playing guitar you know mm-hmm. you learn like ode to joy yeah, right and a couple other little things and then I had a friend, Ian Crabb, in, in high school who was into all sorts of metal. He had a nice Les Paul guitar. And uh, he, he showed me how to play a power chord. Nice. And I, you know, I didn't realize that it's just a fifth yeah. on the guitar. And I remember we were at a, at a show and I asked him, uh, so if I just play these, these, this note and this note, I can play it anywhere off the E string or off the A string. And he was like, yeah, basically. And that was, that was it for me. That was off to the races. So I was just playing, you know, just like a, a straight fifth power chord without even the extra, the extra octave in there yeah, and yeah. just blasting out my own songs and just coming up with whatever weird stuff I could on the guitar. I mean, a lot of guitar stuff, I was just interested in making, making noise with the guitar yeah. as opposed to like actually playing things. Like if I could make a cool sound, that was way more exciting to me than, uh, you know, a melody. Yeah. If I could find an interesting noise, I was all about that. Definitely. Yeah, I was gonna say uh, when 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 you said that uh, you uh, you hopped into Flat Planet, and you got a crash course in playing the upstrokes. Like, did you struggle with it for a second, or or, or, or did you kind of already like understand like where, where where the pocket was with like the drums and all that? No, I had, I had no clue. It was all about <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, for, for for all I knew, it was just, you know, I, I played my ska the same way I played my punk rock, just, you know, as fast as possible. And yeah. uh, so it took me years to really kind of understand that there's there's like a groove and a, and a rhythm to it. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes I, I still feel like I struggle with it a little bit. Um, I'm definitely a lot better about it now. But, uh, you know, it was just one of those things where it was just... I. It, you know, it all just came back to, I just wanted to be in a band. So whatever, whatever I had to do to be in a band, you know, figure it out as you go. Mm-hmm. And then the more, the more you play, the, the more you listen to music, you, you start to figure it out. Yeah. So, so much of, of even what I was being shown as being ska was all, you know, more, you know, ska core, like voodoo glow skulls, 
um, just like spastic ska, like uh, Janitors Against Apartheid. I mean, Janitors Against Apartheid are probably the worst example of how to play ska because they would just play incredibly fast and just super energetic. Like as yeah. fast as you you would expect you were supposed to be playing, they would double that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was just ridiculous. So for that to be my jumping off point, there wasn't like a lot of uh, rhythm or nuance involved in it. It was just go crazy, go as fast as possible. For a, you know, a hyper, you know, aggressive teenager, it was, you know, I was all about it because it was just, you know, I wanted to dance as fast as possible. I wanted to go crazy and I wanted to, you know, mosh and dance and come out of the place, you know, sweaty. Yeah. Um, but, you know, then you realize that, you know, you don't, it, not everything needs to be just hyper, hyper, go, 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 go. Um, yeah. And you can slow it down a little bit. After you, you know, developed your style on guitar and all that, would you say you have kind of like a, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe you started on like a Gibson and you ended up kind of like more like being like a Fender guy or like vice versa, or are, are you not too particular on the type of guitar you use? I'm, I'm not too particular. I mean, I definitely leaned towards, towards Gibson just because I liked, I liked the body shapes more, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, when we were in Link 80, I had a, I had a Gibson uh, hollow body, which mm -hmm. was completely the wrong guitar for that band. <laughs> uh, but it was, what I, it was just what I bought it you know what it yeah. came down to was there was a band in San Jose called 187 Calm and yep. their guitar player Mike Bruce was like the coolest looking dude that I'd ever seen play guitar and okay. he had a he had a um one of those BB King Lucille uh mm. where it looks like it's a hollow body but it doesn't have any f holes oh, and so I I saw him playing that and I was like I want to be that guy so I bought what I thought was like the closest thing when I went to a guitar shop, I, I saw this, uh, jazz guitar that was, um, a little bit, it was a little bit thicker. It was a, and it was like 600 bucks. So that was more in my price range than a $2,000 guitar. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, you know, the first couple tours I did with link 80, I beat the shit out of that guitar to the point where <laughs> when I, when I sold it back, uh, you know, to, to make money when I was home, yeah. you know, I got, you know, maybe a half the money belt rash all on the back and the inside was getting nasty from sweating into it, you know, basically just dumping buckets of sweat through those F holes on the yeah. guitar. Um, we got a sponsorship from a company called Fernandez guitar oh, company. Man. I don't think they're really around anymore. We got yeah. a partial sponsorship from them. So I was able to get these, these two kind of like Les Paul looking guitars. Mm. They were real cheap. Uh, I think they were like $139 each. Got, I got a black one and a yellow one for a backup. You know, since they were so cheap, I would just beat the crap out of those guitars. And, you know, play, play a show and then come off stage sweaty and, and pissed off. And see, you know, all the electronics get corroded and yeah. intonations all out from, you know, yanking on the neck and, and throwing it against stuff. It just, it just, you know, it was yeah. kind of just really aggressive, you know, young person, not really thinking about the future, yeah. <laughs> just yeah. really being, yeah. um, real wild and, uh, to the detriment of, of, you know, my, my guitar. <laughs> Eventually, um, I moved into, I got an SG. I treated it a little bit nicer. Mm -hmm. Um, and then kind of, kind of stuck in that groove, I landed with, um, we used to play with a, my other band, Dessa, we used to play with a band called Facing New York. Okay. Um, the singer from that band, little fun fact, he's, he's like a big time producer now. He produces like a, he produced the most recent Kesha record. Yeah. So my friend Matt, who ended up in Taking Back Sunday, he lent me this guitar for a, a festival that we played in Santa Barbara, opening for the um, Violent Femmes. Uh, RX Bandits played the show too. And I broke a string. I didn't have a backup for the show. Maybe I forgot to change my strings. And so Matt lent me his, his guitar. And I was like, well, this is a good guitar, but he had a sticker over the headstock. So I couldn't tell what type of guitar it was. So I asked him and he told me, he said something about it being probably some slang for it being cool. And I thought that was the brand of the guitar. So I was looking for that. Mm -hmm. Finally, I'd, I asked him and he's like, oh, it's this one, Epiphone Sheridan. So I found one online. I think I bought it. Gosh, I think I, maybe I bought it off of eBay. I think it's maybe the only thing I've ever bought off eBay. Yeah. I think I spent $300 on it. 
and it's it's been a great guitar. I treat it a lot nicer than my guitars in the past. Yeah. But, um, it's definitely it's definitely been a, a good one, and I think it's you know probably the fav- my favorite guitar. What's up, man? I, I was gonna say uh, right now when you're talking about the uh, the uh, sponsorship from Fernandez, it's uh, it's interesting to say that was that was that uh, was that Link Eighty that was sponsored by Fernandez or yeah. So when I joined Link Eighty, I, I started looking into kind of some of the opportunities that maybe we could have as a band. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, I started writing to like string companies and, and guitar companies, and uh, we had a, a P- PV drum sponsorship for a minute. So we had a, a set of PV drums which. I don't know if you've ever seen them before. They have these big wooden hoops that are like real chunky. Yeah. And uh, Joey did not take good care of that kit. I don't know what happened to it, um, <laughs> but it was beat to shit by the time we gave it back. Yeah. And uh, we also, I mean, you, those drums were so weird. You couldn't get cases that fit right. So mm. we would, we just bought a case that was too big and then stuffed it with foam mm. But you know it's getting knocked around in a van and, and getting dragged all over the country. Yeah. His drums, <laughs> most of Joey's drums were no longer round when we were done. They were like <laughs> they're all oval shaped from yeah. like us jumping off of them and stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy because uh like a couple years back I found a, a a a Fernandez video of suicidal tendencies. It was both of their uh, their original guitars and they were both like demoing one of them. It was like an Ibanez like. Fernandez guitar and the other one it was like a Fender like uh Fernandez yeah. guitar and they were pretty killer man um it sucks to hear that they're not around anymore you know because that was like a while ago when I found those videos I was probably like I don't know 2010 or something around there you know yeah yeah I don't I don't know when they stopped um they stopped doing all that but I remember when we went down to play a show I think you know somewhere down south they yeah. had a um they had a warehouse down down somewhere in, in uh southern California and yeah. we we went we went out there and I wanted to get like a weird guitar. I wanted to get one with like a weird body shape. Yeah. The rest of the guys in the band weren't having that though. They were like, you got to get a normal looking guitar, dude. You can't, you can't play out some wacky looking guitar on stage. You so like, All right, so like I, I got these Monterey guitars that looked like, they look like SGs. Okay. Or not SGs, uh, Les Pauls. Yeah. But the, the reason I even thought to look up Fernandez was there was a, this really cool hardcore band from Sacramento called Training for Utopia. Okay. And on the inside of their CD, it said it said they were sponsored by Fernandez. So I was like, oh, if these guys are sponsored, I want to get sponsored. Yeah. And so I like hit up Ernie Ball too, and Ernie Ball like laughed at me. They didn't they didn't want to give us strings, but yeah. then um, Dean Markley gave us strings, and I really kind of only recently stopped getting strings from them. Like they were really cool about letting me just yeah. <laughs> hit them up even after Link Eighty wasn't happening anymore. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I think I was I was delinquent on a couple bills to them. Mm. And they're like, you got to, you got to pay in advance when you get strings from now on, man. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that's fine. Yeah. Damn, that's crazy. I was going to say, uh, so like, uh, like, uh, kind of piggybacking off, you know, like when you joined Link 80, um, I saw that you recorded guitar on the album, The Struggle Continues. Yeah. But, uh, I was going to ask you, did you join like a little bit before the recording process or did you come in like right when that recording process was going on or like. I came in like right when they were going into the studio to record Killing Katie. Oh, so, damn. Okay. So the EP right before. Yeah. So Matt um, had had started college and he was going to college in Santa Cruz. So the way he told me, we actually just talked about this recently. Okay. Uh, so Matt, all through 1997, would go to school all week. And mm-hmm. then the weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, hop in the van with the band, go play shows come back, sleep it off, do school. And he yeah. would just do that for the entire year. But it was taking a toll. You know, they, the band was trying to get more serious and do longer tours. And he, he was pretty sure he wasn't going to be able to, you know, make it work. So yeah. then they placed an ad for another guitar player. And they were kind of playing with the idea, like, do we have two guitar players? Do we just switch off? Do we let Matt do his thing at college and, and uh, Adam do this sometimes? So then when I started practicing with them, they were working on Killing Katie. So my first practice was uh, at the house Nick was staying at uh, out in the East Bay, um, in this little loft space. And they, they were working on those songs for Killing Katie. And I, I remember maybe it was my second or third practice. Mike Park came to practice. He, he wrote up with me from San Jose. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, wrote, he helped write the song, kind of. 
Okay. Uh, 